No, no, no. Here. You want to come? Okay. No, we got. Yes. No, we don't have to be. We don't have to be on each other like that time. Looks like Richard's first. Dylan, can you hear me? He's often first. I'm here. <laughs> What's up, man? Dylan. Hey. Hey, we are so glad to have you and Muhammad on here. We got we got two awesome guests for the crowd tonight. So we know y'all are gonna knock it out of the park. <laughs> hey Scott, can we give Dylan the opportunity to screen share? Because we were not uh, we, huh. we were not able to give everybody him. can screen share. Okay, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I don't set a special permission for that. I just don't allow two people to screen share at the same time. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So Dylan, you're, you're, you feel comfortable screen sharing. Yep. Awesome. Fantastic. <clears throat> well, your pictures are great. Uh, I got to look through them on Instagram, man. And, uh, we can't wait to, we can't wait to show everybody else the photos. Yeah. I can't wait to show them to you guys. Well, you do a lot of hard work. You guys, both of you all do a lot of work. <clears throat> I'm going to go grab another pen real quick. Let me turn my phone off. Man, you killed it today, Chuck. Oh, thanks, man. Sorry about all this. I'm trying to. Rob told me some billionaire needed a mount. So. <laughs> oh, I watched the restream. Uh, I missed the live uh, of Dr. Abel um, Mendez. That was awesome. Um, uh, you know, the Professor Mendez uh, on the Arecibo, and of course the uh, SETI program. That was that was amazing. Yeah. His mind, yeah, he was, he was covering mind his, yeah. his mind blowing. You could see how his mind is really thinking about all the different intelligent ways of kind of structuring it and figuring out how to intelligently categorize um, the search for extraterrestrial life and and intelligent life that was that was really fascinating the way he, his thought process and the way he was speaking about that was really really neat. highly recommended mm -hmm. it's hard let me write it down Yeah, Dr. Caitlin uh, Aarons was, uh, has been finding some awesome, uh, so awesome it's just in the Astro folder. One second. 
NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is designed to answer big questions about the universe. What is dark energy, which seems to be speeding up the expansion of the universe? How many planets exist among the stars, and what are they like? The Roman Space Telescope is similar to Hubble, but benefits from 30 years of technological development. It will view the sky on a scale never before accomplished from space. This is where Roman is closest to Hubble. It has the same size and type of main mirror, a 2.4 meter precisely shaped piece of silver coated glass. The size of this mirror is partly how Roman matches Hubble's resolution. Roman's main camera is the wide field instrument, which will take infrared pictures of the sky to study dark energy, observe galaxies and stars, and find exoplanets. Instead of Hubble's single first-generation image sensor, the WFI incorporates 18 third-generation chips that allow it to take pictures capturing 100 times greater sky area than Hubble's. Each 300 megapixel image will enable scientists to study a large portion of the sky. At Roman's back is its primary means of communication with Earth, the high-gain antenna. This antenna will be responsible for sending nearly 1.4 terabytes of data to ground stations every day. That's the equivalent of 460 hours of streaming video. Roman's critical systems, such as power and data handling, are located in six modules at the spacecraft's rear. These include six rotating reaction wheels that control where the spacecraft points, nearly one ton of propellant for larger movements, and a 10 terabyte data recorder. Roman's other instrument is its coronagraph technology demonstration. A coronagraph blocks a star's light to capture the faint light from orbiting planets. It will be the first time a space telescope has used deformable mirrors to precisely control the incoming light and special masks to block only the starlight. This method will enable Roman to capture direct images of distant planets and even analyze the light that is reflected off their surfaces, allowing scientists to learn about their composition and atmospheres. The spacecraft's solar panels provide its power by converting sunlight into electricity. They also shade the spacecraft, helping to keep its instruments at their design temperatures. The solar panels will be able to provide 4,100 watts of power, enough to run two commercial microwave ovens. With all these systems working together and in partnership with powerful future telescopes, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will be able to usher in a new era of studying our universe. Hey everybody, it's Scott Roberts here with Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and this is our I think fifth episode of uh, Focus on Astrophotography, and uh, we've got some special guests uh, that I'm going to let Ross and Chuck introduce. Um, uh, you know, they got uh, also some nice shout outs, and it's going to be a great show. So, hope you enjoy it, and uh, you guys take it away. Scott, thank you so much. We are really excited. Chuck and I have been working our tails off to get an awesome show, and we have two of the coolest guests ever. We're so happy to have them here. This is our fifth episode, you are correct. And this is episode number five, the German Equatorial Mount, or the gym of astrophotography. And our two guests are super awesome. We're gonna start with the one who came the farthest today, all the way from Cairo, Egypt, Mohammed Usama Ismail. And you can find him at Mohammed Usama 19. He's our first guest, and Chuck's going to introduce our second one. This guy's just as awesome. Yeah, our second guest is Dylan Webster. Uh, Dylan's 14 from, the, uh, from Canada, right, Dylan? Yeah, so he's a young astrophotographer. I think he's been in it for a little over a year. His images are awesome. Um, he really knows his way around, uh, you know, these editing tools. So um, I'm excited to see some of his work. Well, yeah, guys, uh, welcome aboard the mothership. Uh, yes, anybody watching, welcome aboard. We're going to try to go a lot of places today. Tell you about the Equatorial Mount. I just brought one of these massive monsters to show you here. They're incredible. This is the G8 or the G11 
with Explore Scientific PMC-8. And one awesome thing about this mount, real quick, I just want to show you all this. I don't know any other mounts that can do this other than the Lowe's Mandy with the Explore Scientific, but you know, yeah, that's super heavy, but then you just take this guy off and it's so much easier to transport. I've got one of these and it just really changed my whole astrophotography experience because it was so much easier to haul your equipment out there. And that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal when uh, these things weigh so much. Um, yeah, it's definitely yeah. the most important part of when it comes to astrophotography. That's definitely the heart of um, this hobby. Without that, we wouldn't be able to take uh, the amazing pictures that we can um from our backyard so so let's show some of the amazing pictures yeah okay. um dylan you want to uh you want to go with dylan? oh we're well well we'll go with muhammad we start, i'm sorry we yeah. start from the from the farthest so let's show we're going to show three of muhammad's pictures from egypt and they are just so awesome so tell us tell, just go ahead and tell us about this one muhammad man that's awesome hey guys so the story behind this breathtaking images is uh a guy in the image is called Amr Ramadan. Am is used like uh, Sir Mister in Arabic. Uh, so Am Ramadan is like a Sinai Bedouin who admires admires life. Uh, he told us that he loves teaching visitors and tourists his knowledge about the Bedouin life, history. Uh, his pure admire to camels, especially to the is camel called whiskey. Yeah, it's called whiskey. Uh, the camel is not a native breed in Egypt. Uh, he came from a long way from Sudan. Uh, he helps him like to carry luggage and stuff. So at night, at like 3, 3 p.m., I guess, uh, uh, 3 a.m., I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, he was like uh, making a small fire. Uh, he, you, you can find the, uh, some coal and wood in his hand. I just told him like to, to sit uh, oh. in the valley, the St. Catherine Valley. Uh, the St. Catherine Valley, this place is located in, uh, in Egypt. It's really famous so makes so in for for tourists to go there and like enjoy the the nature of Egypt. Um, uh, this place from Egypt took me like eight hours using uh, the bus. Uh, so I told him to sit there and act normal. So he had like a cigarette in his hand and you can find it right there. Uh, I took like I guess seven uh, images and I combined them and then I I took a, a farther step using my star tracker and took the uh, image of the Milky Way. Uh, I guess like it was 40 minutes or 50 minutes. I stuck this and that's the outcome. Well, it's a beautiful outcome. Beautiful. It's a beautiful outcome. And Mohammed, you are, you really focused on um, the mobile setup, right? Because you live, yeah, yeah, yeah. what was it? Bordel? What was the Bordel of Cairo? So I live in Egypt, yeah, Cairo, Egypt. Uh, the portal number is like, I guess nine. Or is it, like I said, it's 3,000 actually. <laughs> so uh, I love to travel around Egypt to take uh, special images using my uh, portable uh, tracker. So many people like have so many que questions, like how can I get so many details uh, using just, just a uh, 135 millimeter uh, lens, prime lens, a, a stock Canon 80D and some astronomic filters. Uh, it's all about passion and commitment. And good, and even like good processing skills, like to be honest. <laughs> yeah, one one second. Do you have? Are you using a star tracker on that? Yeah, uh, I oh. use like this. It's got the Skywatcher Star Adventure. Okay, good deal. Yeah, I used to I used to have one of those. I couldn't I couldn't hear if you were using a tripod or a star tracker, but I mean, going off your work, that's <laughs> that, awesome. that looks like a star tracker. It's that's awesome, a, man. That's some good work, Dylan. You Thank love you. the processing too, don't you? I read one of your posts that just you. The, the processing is really what gets you as well. Yeah, processing is like probably my favorite part just because you really get to see what you captured and yeah. like get to take it in. Mm -hmm. The best part, I just love pulling out all the detail, you know what I mean? It's like just a little bit of a surprise, you know, so. Yeah, it seems, it's like magic. The noise you can get out. So what was, tell us real quick about this photo, Mohammed. So that's like, that's the first time to image uh, image the Orion uh, area using my uh, tracker. It was uh, in late 2019, in I guess December. It, um, I just first I went to time. a place called the Valley. <laughs> yeah, it was my first, really first that is time. That awesome. Uh, I went to a place. Yeah, I, I'll tell you something. My, my main problem was the data. I, I had time learning processing skills on Pixon site and uh, Lightroom. I had, I had my time doing everything. I downloaded the data from every, every observatory available. 
uh, I processed everything. My main problem is finding data. So uh, I'm traveling. Like I, I didn't have the portability of going any port to one place. Uh, the nearest port to one place was like 100 kilometers from my home. So uh, when I first went to this place, this place is called Wadi al Hitan, the Valley of Whales. There they found the oldest whale skeletons uh, in the world. It's like 40 million years ago. In the middle of oh, the wow. desert, you find like skeletons of dead uh, sea animals, whales, uh, so many things. So I went there, I put my tracker at night and got this image. Uh, I can't remember the, the integration time. I guess it was two and a half hours. Uh, I took my time with this image because like after that, the, the corona came and uh, I only had this data to process. Uh, <laughs> I took really my time processing this image. Um, I don't know if uh, you have uh, my, my other image I, I, I shot last time. Yeah, that's, Is this that's your last the difference. one. Well, I do remember yeah, you yeah. saying how the pictures, uh, you know, become stories for you, become memories. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. just a photo. No, no. Every photo has like an, a full experience. From, the, from when I wake up till I go to the place, till I go back home. Uh, the process is mainly traveling. Uh, I wake up in the morning with my friends or like the, uh, the, the, the association that I go with, the Egyptian Society for Astronomy, it's an NGO. Uh, we go around Egypt uh, teaching astronomy for free. Um, sometimes we go to the desert. So I wake up, uh, I get my backpack, I get my uh, star tracker, everything done. Uh, I travel six hours to the desert, explore the desert, have some safari, maybe uh, eat some chicken with the Bedouins, uh, enjoy, enjoy my time, uh, like uh, teaching other people some astrophotography skills and so many things. And then my night is mine. I stay from like 7 uh, to 3, p 3 uh, a.m. imaging the sky using my tracker. Uh, also, put in mind that this photo was uh, sh shot using narrow band, and my and my camera is stuck, so it was really really hard to get uh, H alpha data and O3 data using my stock camera. Uh, many people ask me like, why do you use stock camera? Because I love day photography. Like uh, I enjoy having like pure images without uh, the redshift, uh, the, although it's, it's really helpful with astrophotography, but still, still I don't have the enough uh, time uh, and money to get uh, the, another DSLR. So this image uh, took me so, so, so many days. I took the H alpha data last year and the O3 da data this year. Uh, yeah. uh, this was uh, chosen. Absolutely, man. The cloud. I mean, the gas, the dark. I mean, you really got the the those dark gases pop out. I mean, it looks like. Uh, I mean, it looks like clouds. You did a beautiful job editing it. Um, I mean, I'm really impressed how you got that out of a stock camera. The real cool part Thank is you. you can, with a wide field, you can see all the different uh, nebulosities that kind of uh, pop out. Like you know, the, you see the crescent nebula very clear. Obviously, in a different uh, band, that's going to be your hydrogen, right? And then, and then you have your yeah. O3. It's just, it's just amazing. And like you said, you used, you only use two narrow bands, right? The O3 and H. Yeah, I H alpha, I, I yeah H alpha and O3. Yeah, that's it. Wow, it's just awesome. And then you can see the nebulosity. You can see the Seder region. Um, this is actually, I think uh, you can't. Is that the is that the pelican nebula? The, uh, no. no, that's the uh, butterfly no, but, nebula. Butterfly nebula, that's right. Wow, just amazing. This really gives uh, you a 3D effect too. You can really see like the depth of the uh, nebulosity, you know, no, as if so you're good. going through <clears throat> space. I, uh, I don't know hey, if you I have- uh, say, yeah. Go ahead, Mohammed. sorry. No, no, you, you can say, you can okay. say. Okay, well, I just, I wanted to let all our viewers know too. Um, two days ago, what happened? You well, you graduated from college, right? Two days yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Congratulations from everyone here at Explore Thank Scientific. Thank you so much. Um, you are uh, truly, I mean, you fill out our name. You are an explorer scientist. And so we're so glad so to much. have you on, Mohammed. Um, you know, I would love to make it to Egypt sometime and yeah, yeah, you need to come. Cars with you. You need to come. Inshallah. 
Inshallah. Let's do it. But, so Dylan, you want to share your screen now and let's see, let's see one of the best 14 year olds, if not the best 14 year old astrophotographer on the planet today. <laughs> Dylan, uh, tell us about when you got started and how you got started. So oh, let me turn my screen sharing off. Sorry. So I started uh, astrophotography in November 2019, and what I had was just a stock Canon 450D and a kit lens. And what I would do is I had this little tripod that was could like sit on a table, and I would just put it on the porch, and I would take. And this was um, during the time when Orion was just popping up, so I was taking photos of the Orion constellation. And then sometimes I would um, zoom the lens into 55 millimeters and take shots of the Orion Nebula. And I remember being able to see the Orion Nebula as a little pink speck there. Yeah. And I remember being so excited to see it. It's, it's very how, exciting. How do you, were you just always fascinated with the night sky? I remember you, I'm, I know me and you kind of have a similar background. We both, uh, kind of grew up well I didn't grow up in a dark in a, around a dark side but you did correct and you in yeah. your house pretty dark in a dark area yeah it's a like a Bortle three four location and yeah. so yeah like taking wide field shots with the camera like there's just so many stars even in like a 10 second exposure and like if I stacked a few of them you could see the winter Milky Way alongside Orion it was yeah. like yeah it was really cool to see so yeah let's like, check out some pictures yeah here i'll share my screen here awesome you see that's what's awesome about it he just had a dslr hanging around mm -hmm. and so there you go he got started with just a dslr yeah. and a tripod and and as we've seen a stock dslr can get you some incredible shots so um i think you guys can see the screen there yeah all right beautiful so, all right the crescent nebula yes yeah so this was an image i took about a month ago this is uh six hours of data with my new uh dedicated astronomy camera my first dedicated astronomy camera it's a qhy 163m no, and I, I, mean, I have I mean, that camera that's an h alpha oh, yep yeah, yeah, yeah this uh, what? seven nanometer h alpha filter what scope are you using? I was using uh, my five inch Schmidt Cassegrain and okay, I had it. Wow, good job. And I had a, a F6.3 reducer on it and it took it down to 787 millimeter focal length. Nice. That's a good one for framing. Yeah, that's, that's a good size. Yeah, good so length. this data was taken, it was taken over two nights, but if you want to include calibration frames, it would be three nights because I did all my calibration frames in one night when it was cloudy. Mm -hmm. And then I processed this in PixInsight and uh, wow. Photoshop. Beautiful. Nice. I need to go back to that one. Awesome I just shot structure. that one myself, but I didn't have enough data. And I'm going to have an O3 filter soon. Like I'm just getting into monochrome. So all I had was an H alpha filter originally. Yeah. So um, I'm going to get an O3 filter and hopefully I can make an, an HOO bicolor image. Yeah, get that, get that outer shell. That yeah, I'm probably going to spend maybe two or three nights. I want to get at least like seven to ten hours just yeah. because of how faint the O3 shell is. That, that's one problem. That's awesome. And that's one of my problems, too. I, I mean, there's so many different factors because our weather has been awful, but a lot of people, when they're when they make that transfer over to a dedicated astro camera, some people think they only need three or four hours of data. But really, you, I mean, even with a color camera, you need double that, in my opinion. Yeah, like <laughs> after the first night when I had three or four hours of data, um, the crescent was visible, but it was just too noisy and all the background nebulosity was just a hard, super hard to pull out without making the image look awful with the amount of noise there was. So yeah. I decided to do another night on it and, and it definitely pays off. It's, it's so like, it's a great, I've show. always taught myself that it's like if you don't have at least three hours of data you're not getting an image out of it 
Yeah. That's what, from uh, my Let's experience. check out another image. Pardon? Oh, let's check out. You, you have another image to share? Okay. So let's see here. So this is the Dumbbell Nebula. Wow. Nice. Was, Very that, nice. And that's wow. the same same setup, same everything. Yeah. And this, this was uh, three hours of data. And I thought about returning to this target, but the Dumbbell Nebula is just so bright that like the signal to noise ratio was excellent. It is excellent. It. And I was really happy to be able to pull out that faint h alpha shell around it yeah. you're using pix inside aren't you yep okay what do you uh i know uh not trying to what do you use photoshop also what are you doing in photoshop um well so pix inside i mainly do like dynamic background extraction just to correct all the issues in the image and then i bring it into photoshop and everything else is done in there like i'll for a monochrome image here i'll like select parts of the nebula to sharpen or to bring out yeah and use star and do star reduction and noise reduction just all the basic stuff yeah i can't wait for you to get that out of three filter yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The images are great man yeah. with the dumbbell nebula the o3 shell is like so much more prominent than the h alpha shell so and that's why I was really surprised to be able to bring out the H alpha shell because it just makes it look so much better. Yeah, it really looks alive. Yeah, and, uh, and like, the Dylan? nebula is so intricate in H alpha too compared to O three. I find right. I find Dylan. I, I wanted to ask you. Maybe you already covered this, but how old were you when you got into astronomy? Uh, I would have been. Or to start astrophotography, I would have been 12. 12? Because uh, my birthday is in that? August. And, um, or did you just jump straight into astrophotography? Um, I've always had like a fascination for astronomy. I've always thought like aerospace and that. I've always had a fascination for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like seeing like Hubble images, for example, I always thought like those were really neat. And then until I discovered that there are people that can take photos like that of nebulas and galaxies from their backyard. And I thought like, hmm, maybe, maybe I'll try that. Yeah, so I did some research, figured out what I needed to buy and kind of just went on from there. That's great. Wow. That is so cool. When I was your age, Dylan, I was looking at them in the library. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and now that you can do this yourself, isn't that fantastic? Yeah, like the hobbies become like so much more affordable and it's a lot easier to get into because of how available all this advanced equipment is becoming. And and then my I final think it, image I think it's great. Here. Give us one more, Dylan. We need one more. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, wow. I saw this one in so What? That is That's awesome, man. Super. God. Y'all y'all both y'all both have Killer shots. Awesome Milky Way uh, images. Y'all's uh y'all skill for processing the the Milky Way is a, is definitely above average. Off the hook. It's yeah, great. I'd say the mothership has definitely taken us to the future of astrophotography. We've got a 14 year old and a 22 year old, and one will probably be at MIT in four years, and the other one will probably be working for NASA. So uh, <laughs> thank you guys. So much for sharing both, these awesome images. Yeah, man, both of, um, it's so great. You both have raised the bar. Tell us about uh, this one real fast. What do you What do you use to image this one, Dylan? So for this image, I use my DSLR. I am, and at the time of taking this, um, my DSLR, like we, my dad and I modified it back, yeah. I think, in July last year. And so it makes it a lot easier to bring out like the, you can see the Eagle Nebula or the Omega, the Lagoon and all like the other H alpha pockets mm -hmm. um, in the Milky Way core. And then I used a kit lens, just the one that came with the camera. And I had it at 18 millimeter at F 3.5. And this is like a crop from data I had. I just, I thought it was a creative crop of the image. Yeah. I thought it yeah. looked really cool. No, that's awesome. And then I had my camera riding on top of my SCT, which was on my EQ mount, and I tracked it. 
and this was one night of data I got I think uh four or five hours on it and I stayed up till two in the morning manually dithering between each exposure mm. and then okay, sure. after 2 a.m I just decided I'm not doing this for the whole night <laughs> so I just left it going for the rest of the night without dithering well, Mohammed, you said you did uh you had your own dithering routine yeah. as well, correct? <laughs> so, um, if possible, I uh, after uh, Dylan, uh, of course, can I share my screen? I I want I really wanted to show something. Oh. Uh, yeah, share sure. it, man. Oh, uh, Dylan, can yeah. you stop sharing? Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. There you go, Mohammed. So, can you see it uh, right now? Yes. Yeah. So. Like uh, those images was like really from the beginning. Uh, after that, I, I used my 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 portable setup. just like so. Uh, this this was like the latest image I took. Uh, it was six hours. Um, Beautiful. Wow. Uh, Look at that. <laughs> That's the Milky Way. That's really beautiful. Is that a mosaic? No, it, it was it's like a... uh, it was just just a sh one shot. Oh, I'm God. trying to uh, minimize the. <laughs> uh, so apparently, I have a problem with it. So no problem, no problem. Uh, I'll try to open another image. Wow. Uh, oh, one God, of the images crazy. that I really, really uh, worked on with the Andromeda. Uh, this took me so much time uh, while, while mm. processing. Uh, you can clearly see the H alpha da small data uh, around Your the background is right great on that photo. Yeah, so, that's uh, one. That's one advantage of a stock camera is Andromeda. Yeah. you can pull out all that color uh, contrast from that stock DSLR. Uh, I was just really hard to get to... that purple out of a dedicated astro cam. Um, this was like the latest Orion Nebula. This was shot using a 135 millimeter uh, lens. Uh, this was clearly cropped, like the original uh, data uh, mm. was really different. Uh, it was uh, uh, this one. Uh, I cropped this part and I took uh, four uh, hours of H alpha and I made the, an H alpha green blue uh, combination. No, I see all the awesome. Oh, yeah. are. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love the framing. It's everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the last, the very, very, very last one. Okay, uh, one more, Mohammed. Um, okay. <laughs> one more. Uh, yeah, really, amazing amazing well, well, I, I love that, man. You take the stars out of that one. Yeah. Well, you got a good sp spread of color, too. Yeah, to thank you so color, much. I guess. Fantastic. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my main problem was using a stock DSLR. Like, uh, it takes like four times the time uh, from a cool uh, dedicated uh, CCD camera. And so my main problem was the noise to uh, data ratio, because uh, for this image, I guess it took from me like uh, 30, about 14 hours uh, in Bortel 2 and one. Uh, but look at the texture around the Pelican Nebula. This yes, is, the, and, and the right. Gulf. It's yeah, like, I can't wow. get my eyes off of that. It's really yeah. it's fantastic. Hey, I wanted to quickly ask you, you got the sky plot thing going on that's that's really cool how, how do you do that um uh, do you mean an astrobin that's an astrobin so it, it just yeah, does yeah. the plate, plate cell for yeah, you yeah 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 it, it does yeah, yeah it's, it's really nice <laughs> yeah cool. it's okay. I'll take yeah, that yeah, one offline cool. but <laughs> that's really cool i love it <laughs> all right we're gonna move on yeah guys stay tuned because annie has probably got some awesome astronomical announcements in our new segment here we are so glad because uh, we got some contests and awards, and Annie is going to let you all know you guys should submit. Yeah. Also, uh, Dylan and Mohammed, uh, Thank whenever – uh, is it Galaxy? What, Galaxy what, season? No, what, what contest is running right now? Well, Annie's Annie, going to tell us. Tell Annie's going to tell us. <laughs> hey, guys. How's it going? So uh, great things are happening here at Explore Scientific. Um, we have had a very, 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 very busy day. It's been crazy. Um, it's been all hands on deck. We have inventory coming in, items coming in. Even Scott came out and joined us and started unloading a truck with us. And so we've got some footage right. of that. And so um, get my so exercise somehow. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, everybody around here has been working quickly. 
and as fast as we can because we have quite a few trucks coming. So, but anyways, um, I just want to tell everybody we still have that astro for, uh, astrophotography contest going on, Galaxies. It's going to run through August fifteenth. So make sure you get those entries in. It you have to be a you have to be a member to submit um, an entry, and it is two it is two pictures per um, in per person. Um, and then we have some great prizes, and we also have that new. Um, uh, never before entered um, um, category. So uh, we want to see some new stuff, um, some new people, some new stuff, and we're excited. We're excited. We're excited. So uh, on top of all of that, on um, August 19th through the 21st, we have the Astronomical um, uh, League Conference. It's going to be a three-day conference. It's going to be virtual. Um, you guys can check that out. It's on our website. And it's, it's free. Yeah. So you know, uh, usually for an Alcon meeting, you, you have to pay, you know, to be at those those things. So, but this is going to have some just really amazing speakers at it. Uh, I think the, the, the really interesting thing was, is that, um, you know, it's long been known that the Astronomical League is one of the largest or maybe the largest federation of astronomy clubs in the world. Uh, but, uh I think for the very first time they kind of they were looking for door prizes for this Alcon event and instead of just going only to the vendors, you know, of course that that was done as well, but they went back to the clubs and they said, Okay, uh, you guys out of the clubs yourselves, what would you like to donate as the prizes for this? And they're up, I think, over eight thousand dollars in prizes right now. So yeah, and cool. you, you can, uh, we have a link on our calendar, so you can click on that and it should take you to their page so you can register for that. Like, like Scott said, it's free register. You can have a chance to win those prizes. Um, we also have the, I, we don't really have anything on our website for it, but the Nebraska star party is, um, the first weekend in August. And so we just like to talk about that because we, you know, we have uh, John Johnson as part of us. And so we try to we try to promote that as much as possible. And it's going to be an amazing event. Um, it's absolutely beautiful to go do and be a part of. So, and then the last thing is we still have those crystal etched uh, ED-152 uh, desk decors that are um, on, that are, um, that are for uh, platinum members only. Um, they retail for $99 and so we're selling them for $59.99. Um, so we have that going um, and I, we sent out an email. Um, it actually went out today. So, and I've already gotten some responses from it. So that's really good. And then those Bino viewers, you can still pre-order those Bino viewers. So um, yeah, so, oh, one other thing before I forget, we sent out a survey for all of our PMC8, all of our PMC8 people and our customers. So we have a survey out there just kind of wanting to know, you know, how things are going, what you like, what you don't like, if you've upgraded, if you've updated your system, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, we already, we have already had 46 people respond to that in two days. And so um, if you see that email and you own a PMCA, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. So uh, please, please, please fill that out and send it out to us. We're only going to go, we're only going to have that survey open through August 1st. So, and there's some prizes for it if you, if you fill it out and send it in. So we're going to have a drawing. So, but yeah. Awesome. Thank That's you, about Annie. Everything, so. Yeah, Annie, they, she wants your reports on the PMC8, and we want your pictures yeah. bro, that you took with the PMC8. Um, <clears throat> so real quick, we're going to do one more shout out to the Austin Astronomical Society, austinastro.org. They've got a really cool member and probably a bunch of really cool members. But Mike Morota, he's a great guy. And so we're giving a shout out to his uh, astronomy club over in Austin. And I'm sure they keep it weird. So come on up to the mothership with us. And let's quickly move over yeah. to everyone's favorite. Everyone's favorite part of the show, Chuck's Constellation Crunch. All right. So uh, the Constellation Crunch for this week is going to be the Serpents uh, <laughs> Constellation. Um, it's in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, actually, it's a constellation of the Nor uh, Northern Hemisphere. Um, this constellation is very unique because it's uh, one of only a couple that's actually split into two parts. You have the serpents kaput, which is the head, which is in the west, and then the serpents caudia is the tail, which is to the east. Um, this constellation actually passes behind uh, 
the serpent barrier um, constellation, which is the Ochi uh, complex. Um, the brightest star of this constellation is the Alpha uh, Alpha uh, Serpentis, which is, has a magnitude of two point six three. And I only picked three objects that are actually in this constellation that I found really interesting. One of them being the ring galaxy, which is a very, very, uh, its structure is of a ring. And there's actually not a lot of galaxies like that, that we know of in our universe. Um, it's crazy to look at. Uh, I couldn't, I think it's pretty deep. So uh, not a lot of amateur mm -hmm. astronomers are imaging it. Um, another one that is very easy for uh, a beginner or someone that has a DSLR hanging around their house and they want to shoot an object that's up in the sky right now is Messier 5, which is a, a glob cluster. And then the last one that I picked, of course, is uh, Messier 16, which is the Eagle Nebula. And I actually just shot this one. Um, Let's show that. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, we'll go to the screen share. So. This is it's yeah, that's the wrong one. This is the wrong one? Yeah. Well, this is the only one I have. Get back. Get, uh, oh, that's get back. so nice. Um, no, this is that's the only one I had, man. Um, that's the TIFF one. Get, go to the file at the bottom. Okay. There you go. This one. Okay. Yeah. Can you all see that one? See a star map. Um, oh, here, let's, let's okay. switch the sharing, what we're sharing. Um, Sorry about that. There it is. Yeah, so, okay, so I imaged this last week. Uh, this is seven wow. hours of data with the L Enhance filter. I use the ASI 533 MC Pro. Um, this is through our ED127 FCD100 triplet refractor. And then it was riding on top of our XS2 PMC8. I actually went back and edited this one a couple of times because I kept blowing out uh, the pillars. Uh, well, actually behind the pillars. And so I could have dimmed this one down a little bit to actually, uh, so you could have seen the, the pillars oh, perfectly. Range, yeah. But I like how there's a little, you can see that last pillar, but there's a little bit of a reflection off of it. I just like the way that looked. Um, if you want to zoom in a little bit gives a little bit of a pop but i've been experimenting with some some plugins and uh i don't know i really like uh it's very smooth yeah if someone you can have a plugin if anyone's doing photoshop go to uh annie's astro tools and there's a plugin uh on that one for uh reducing the star oh well you can brighten the star color but also reduce it so it makes your stars smaller and it has that all that nebulosity popping out in front of the stars. It gives it a really good look. Keep it zoomed in for a second. I, I, I really want yeah. to point out, I like those two uh, dark nebulae that are just kind of hanging. Oh, these guys? Yeah, those guys, are, that's really cool. Th those have Suspended. a special name and I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Um, Bach Globulars, B-O-K, I think it's yeah. one of it. That's Bach. right. Yeah, yeah, named after, say something. Named no, after like Bart Bach. Bart Bach. Yeah, I was going to say, and even with like the the L enhance it was. Yeah, it was the L enhance. Um, the like the star, I love the star colors too. Like you made them look really natural, like it was shot just with broadband. Well, the what so what happened was I've got the L Extreme filter too, and I forgot to switch them before I started shooting. So I was just like, you know what? I'm in a dark sky. For some reason. If you're in a darker sky, that L enhanced filter really makes everything mm -hmm. pop, even though it's a wider band pass. It's a great filter. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it in dark skies. But also another uh, key thing about this constellation, it actually passes through the, the Milky Way's galactic plane. So, uh, you know, people shooting the Milky Way, uh, you know, it, it very, mm -hmm. you can see it if you're shooting the Milky Way kind of close up, but this is another, um, I really like this constellation um, just because it's in the smack dab of, a, of the galactic plane. Um, I, unfortunately, it is almost always behind trees for me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, those are always the challenges. One thing I liked about it that I, that I saw, um, I think there are 21 or 22 stars. And you want to get back. Supposedly that, uh, let's, let's turn the screen share up. That, okay, that now. had, um, that referenced the 21 territories or the 22 territories of China. 
And I just, you know, because the stars really do bring us all together. We're, whether we're in Cairo, um, whether we're in India, like our other guests or New Zealand, um, we've all got our stories with the stars. And so we are going to go into the Equatorial Mount now. And Cameron is going to talk about his experience with these gems of mounts. And uh, so I want to I want to hear about Cameron and, and his experience with these Equatorial Mounts. All right. Hey, thanks, guys. And well, be, also, real well, fast, guys, if y'all yeah. want to jump in at any point, y'all are more than welcome to. So, but yeah, Cameron, let's hear some stuff. Sure, sure. So before I uh, go on my my spiel, um, again, another just a shout out to Mohammed and Dylan. Uh, you guys have raised the bar and you've increased the signal with noise. Uh, of of uh, you, you've <laughs> really made you've made the uh, the level. Of improve, you know, of, of enhanced imagery and astrophotography, you brought it to a whole new level, and it's it's really great to see. Fantastic, good good work, good work, very inspirational. And I'm going to be asking you questions, you. even though I'm an old guy. <laughs> and I, I'm uh, I, I was working with uh, older technology. Um, I'm kind of getting up to speed, and I'm going in this journey. And I can see you guys are already light years ahead, and this is great. It's very inspirational. So. It's really nice to be We're able on the to be part of this. together, Cameron. We're, We're all on together. together. Yeah, it's a great team. I, I love it. So it's really cool. Great to have you aboard. <laughs> so um, great to be aboard. So um, with that, let me uh, share. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Um, Cameron, are you still doing EAA? Are you getting more into imaging? Yeah, when I hear uh, the quick answer is I'm still focused on EAA. Um, you know, okay. when I hear... Uh, Dylan and, and Mohammed talk about like tens of hours, of, you know, three hour chunks and stuff like that. Um, I'm not there yet. Um, I'm still focusing on the survey and kind of getting uh, a, a basic uh, qual, you know, making sure my basic images are built from a good solid foundation. And so that I can repeat, have a reliable, repeatable, uh, stacked, low exposure uh, imagery. With uh, so to be able to get decent photos of uh, of a lot of uh, objects for the sky survey, and then to your point, I want to be able to capture and and do the stuff like the ring galaxy and that uh, and and some of these other more obscure objects uh, as part of my sky survey, and then yeah. and then and, and then come back to them with uh, with mm. longer hours, right? And and start to uh, you know because I'll, I'll by then I'll have an equatorial mount, a new equatorial mount. And uh, and be able to take longer exposures and be able to do that because right now I'm somewhat limited uh, with my current setup because I I only have an Altaz. So what I'm going to share with uh, right now and kind of introduce the topic is um, you can see my screen. Uh, this this is uh, more than 20 years ago. This is my last equatorial mount. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm going to I'm going to talk to you guys about equatorial mounts uh, in the terms of my experience um and and then w the way i see them today compared to the way i used to see them in my past um so i had a six inch newtonian similar to this not exactly this model but i had a good old super polar iris uh, eq mount if some of those you guys remember with a with an aluminum tripod and um and i used this but i was only visual and i've been visual for many many years until of course this new era of uh, of digital astrophotography uh, that's brought me into the into the imaging uh, forum. So when I was back then, um, I was using this, and it, it I had if you zoom in, if I zoom in here, I had uh, a little motor drive that would actually piggyback on on here, a little clock quartz uh, a clock drive that would gear mesh with this. Uh, you can't quite see the resolution is very good, but on the right ascension, right ascension axis, I'd plug that guy in. And then it would it was actually an extremely good mount um, and, and extremely accurate for visual. I never used it for astrophotography, but um, but uh, this was the mount I had, and uh, I actually sold it um, because, uh, as you can see here, with visual, since I was really focused on visual, uh, when you start playing with an equatorial mount, one of the challenges is when you reorientate scope or especially if you have a diagonal, if you have a refractor or even a Newtonian, uh, you get into these weird contorted positions uh, as you move the equatorial mount around. And that's just an honest uh, feedback from a visual observer. 
Um, and then what happens is you have to rebalance constantly because you're changing that. But if you move over to digital astrophotography uh, now, uh, I am now, I think equatorial mounts are going to come and have a resurgence, which they are, you can clearly see they are. Uh, because now what you can do with an imaging setup, you can rebalance, you can set the, uh, uh, the focuser so that you can keep the balance uh, of your, uh, of your image train. And you don't have to worry about what angle that is um, as, as, because you're going to be operating this <clears throat> and it will always be in, a, in the same orientation and you never have to readjust the tube or the, uh, or the diagonal, for example, because if it's just a refractor, you just have it in line. So uh, I'm, I'm in the process of getting a new equatorial mount because I'm limited to altazimuth. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about you know, using, uh, I'm going to use Sky Safari to kind of explain the, the reason why you want to get an equatorial mount for imaging um, compared to uh, visual. Visual, here, here I have, if I look at the settings, I have uh, it set up as an Altaz mount. So you'll see that the, uh, the image circle or the image frame in my, uh, I've set up uh, two different image frames. One is the, um, if I look at my scope display. Cameron, one how of them long is, usually, if you take an image, how long is your exposure usually with that azimuth mount? Exactly. Uh, I'm limited to about 30 seconds. If I go to, yeah. if, if I, if I, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. And the reason why is because what happens is uh, I'm just using the, um, as soon as you go an alt azimuth, you always have to do an adjustment uh, on one of the, on the, uh, on, both axes, and that mm -hmm. causes two different things. It causes a uh, periodic error correction, if you will, uh, and it also causes field rotation. So those two things um, are, are are your bane when that your limitation is with go to. So so far, the reason why I'm really focused on EAA uh, and and taking stacks of ten and thirty seconds is because of the uh, the go the altas. As soon as I go to equatorial, I can start to go to minutes and, you know, and then start to stack for over hours. And then it will, it won't have any field rotation and you'll be able to layer the stars and have longer exposure. So, so with that, um, I, I have two different image uh, frames, uh, my 80 millimeter uh, uh, ED80 and then uh, my eight inch Schmidt green. And both of them are using ASI 294 um, four third sensor. And if I go to, uh, so as I move around on my azimuth and my altitude, you'll see that it's always parallel to the horizon, not with the axis of the, uh, of the um, not with right ascension and declination. So if I go around zenith and I, I rotate around, the problem with, uh, go with the uh, altazimuth is as you go to zenith, as you can see, it gets a little bit wonky and you actually have a problem because if I, let me go to uh, an object here, Let's go to um, the Helix Galaxy, let's say, or um, let's choose an, uh, let's choose, let's choose Bear Paw Galaxy. And I zoom in, I center on that. Now if I zoom in there, if I go in time, as I move forward, watch what will happen, watch, watch what happens with my image circle. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit more. There we go. As I move forward in time by an hour, you see that field rotation, right? You start to see the uh, the stars. And what what this means on the on the macro scale? If I zoom back out, you see zenith here. As I move through the hours, you see I'm moving through zenith. Basically, what happens is it starts to um, rotate uh, the image because you have to compensate to keep the, the object in the center of the field because it basically limits your, um, your field, uh, your tracking ability, so that when you move closer to the zenith, you're gonna have a bigger and bigger adjustment in both uh, altitude and azimuth. And that, that means that you can, you can only take shorter and shorter exposures before you have an adjustment in your image. And that hey, causes Cameron, star I'm so glad you chose the bear paw cam. Uh... Cameron, I'm so glad you chose the bear paw. I've got a picture of that I'll share when you're done that I that I took with uh, 102. 
Great, great. Let me let me give another example. I'm going to zoom back. I'm going to go back here. Something a little more familiar to everyone. Let's go to Ryan Nebula. So this is a little easier because it's closer to the uh, equator. Oops, oh, sorry about that. Not cooperating with me. Come on. What is going on here? <laughs> there we go, finally. Okay. So if I center on that, so then you, you'll see as I move through time, go back in time here by one hour increments. It's a little bit of, there we go. So as you move through the time, you can see the the uh, the image frame stays parallel with the horizon, but it, there's a rotation in Orion as it goes from east to west. And so what happens, what that means in terms of your exposures with Altaz is within a minute, you're gonna to have to adjust your azimuth and that causes a movement. Now, if I change to an equatorial, let's change the settings here, change to equatorial coordinate system. And I can also change mount to equatorial. Um, where is it? Here we go. Change to an equatorial mount. Now, when I move left to right, you see everything follows by descension and declination. If I go through zenith, right, there's no problem. You can go right past zenith without any weird contortions. Uh, you, obviously, as you get close to the pole, you're going to have the same type of issue as you move around. But the, the advantage, of course, is that uh, if I just get out of this mode, there we go. Uh, the advantage is you'll always keep the same frame. You're not going to have any field rotation, so you can take longer exposures. And you're doing your adjustments only on one axis. So if I go back to the Orion Nebula, and I center on that again, and this is kind of, a, if I change, you'll notice if I change the time by hours, nothing happens because there's, because you're always in the same axis, same, same, same frame of reference. No, so you're not doing any, you, you can go on for as long as you want. So you can take super long exposures. You don't have any, you're only adjusting on one axis. <clears throat> so basically uh, this is, a, when you get into astrophotography, an equatorial mount is an absolute must. So that's really yes, what sir. I wanted to highlight here. Yes, so, sir. And that is that is exactly, and that's where we're going with where we're going with it here, because um, li like you said, you need to be on that object longer. And back in the day, it was double stars that we were all looking at. Um, but so let's, I'm going to, when you get a chance, I'll share that bear paw. And then we're going yeah, to talk about Joseph von Fraunhofer and uh just probably the greatest development in astrophotography, at least, uh, that maybe we've ever had. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Richard Kramer and uh, his, his speech about it. Um, but so let's share it. I'll show you guys the bear paw just because Cameron inspired me there a little bit. And I was, it's just um, a rarely imaged. Um, but yeah, you can kind of, there's the bear paw. Um, and it is very far away in Ursa Major. Yeah. Um, but we will go and we will talk about the great equatorial mount that you have to have um, if you want to get these long exposure photographs. Dylan, what, uh, what mount are you using? Um, I use like an old Celestron uh, CG5, like the predecessor to the AVX. Yeah, that's the bigger. Is that the bigger one? No, it's uh, it's like same payload capacity and everything. Just uh, like it's just an older version of the AVX, basically. Yeah. Do you have a? Uh, I know we're about to. Just one quick question. Do you have a lot of backlash with that one? Because don't the the AVXs are don't they have a problem with backlash on some of um, them? It's it's not too bad in my case. Like with the mount I got, I'm 
guiding down to 0.6 sometimes, but nice. on average, it hangs around probably 0.8 to 1.2. Nice. Well, Ross, tell us a little bit about Okay, this. we'll do a story time with Ross. And we're going to talk a little bit about Joseph von Fraunhofer. Um, he was a German, and you're going to notice a lot of the foundations of ast astronomy and astrophotography uh, were started with him. And, you know, they might have been present for a while before then. But Joseph, he was an orphan at a young age and just had trial after trial after trial. But um, this guy was a worker and he kept working and kept working and kept working and grinding glass and using new techniques. And, you know, the glass and the lenses and the mirrors and everything just kept improving and kept improving and getting faster and faster and faster. And so what, um, you know, an Ivy League professor, we would call that like a reverse salient. Okay, so we're zooming in really close. We are getting closer and closer. It's the 1700s, and we're so close, but these stars, you know, they're moving. The closer you get, the more precise you have to be, and the quicker the stars are going to move. So this is kind of one of the ways that they tried to deal with that before Joseph put his big brain onto the problem. Um, and then Herschel, you might have heard of him. He, oh, come on. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of Herschel's famous big reflecting telescope. <clears throat> and he could not move that with time either. Um, and he was able to narrow uh, a double star down to a five arc second separation. And anything lower than that was pretty much guesswork. And then Joseph von Fraunhofer came around and, uh, you know, he just started to get that competitive those competitive juices flowing. And I don't know if you've heard the argument about refractors versus reflectors, um, but he, uh, he and uh, Wilhelm Struve certainly uh, promoted, promoted this uh, fight. Team and, refractor, right? Yeah, yeah, team refractor. <laughs> and, um, you know, so Joseph built this beautiful engineered mount, the first German equatorial mount, and that's why it's German, because he was in Bavaria. And he then built this beautiful telescope to sit on top of it. It was 14 foot focal length, F 17.7, 240 millimeters. And there's a reproduction of it. So you can kind of see a chair and see how big this guy was. And so, you know, what happens is they're zooming in, these lenses are getting better. Um, we're arguing whether English glass is better than German glass and flint versus crown. And you might notice it today with FCD 100 or fluorite or many of the other types of glasses. FPL 53. We, uh, the fight continues and it's just pushing us along and along. Um, but, you know, so he built this beautiful, awesome, big set of equipment. It weighed 5,000, as written here, 5,000 Russian pounds. I'm not sure. It's probably a little bit heavier since it's Russian. Um, <laughs> But, and they sent this thing 1,500 miles across Germany um, to the uh, observatory, the Dorpot Reservatory, uh, observatory, where it would be stationed. And, you know, funnily and funny enough, um, another, another thing that was developed here was, well, he sent this huge 50 crates, 5,000 pounds. Um, there were no instructions on how to use or put together the telescope. And if you buy a really expensive telescope, you might find that funny. Um, but he, the, the revolutionary thing was the clockwork. Um, and you could set this thing up and it would stick on that star. And um, many of y'all might know Bode's galaxy or Bode, I'm, I'm not sure the pronunciation. And, and Chuck and I joked like, you know, we're gonna really mess up some pronunciations today, uh, but that's okay. And you might know Bodhi's galaxy. It's, it's a beautiful one up there. Uh, I believe in Ursa Major as well. But the famous astronomer Bodhi said, you can't do it. Time tracking is impossible. Well, Joseph Fraunhofer was able to do it. And a refractor um, at 240 millimeter focal length was able to separate uh, stars that were only separated by 1.3 arc seconds. Nice. Um, so I had some funny lines here. Um, 
So it was in in, in reference to um, a double star in in boots. Uh, Herschel was able to see a fourth class, uh, so one that was I think four arc seconds away. And uh, Struve writes here, well, yeah, there's a fourth class one, but did you see the first class one? It's even closer. Um, and just how incredible it was to be able to keep that star uh, right on target. And um, <clears throat> so you definitely had uh, which glass is the best, refractors versus reflectors, and the new evolution of time tracking. And well, was it a wind up? Do you know? Do you, do you... I, I believe it was, it was wound up, but what I read was that you could wind it up while it was running and it wouldn't affect its its motion yeah. um there's a star tracker like that out there yeah that, it's probably, always when you were only had weight it, it reminded mm -hmm. me of that because only had done imagine her cranking yeah. in her wand Crank, it. yeah well okay so and i watched this video of dr richard kramer from dartmouth and he's just he told us you know and he knows astronomers really love their history and so i, I wanted to tell this story and you can watch his video. It is super awesome on YouTube. And he'll talk about reverse salience and salience. And, you know, but what to me it really is, is a horse race. And, you know, back in the day, you had this horse and they just kept winning every time. And no one wanted to go to the track. No one would bet their money. No, you know, you knew which horse was going to win. And it was the glass or it was the mirrors. It, nothing could keep up with that technology nothing could keep up with that horse so you didn't go to the horse races you didn't watch them anymore and then this mount came along and that horse that was winning all the time it started looking back and said oh other people are running with me now i've got some horses catching up and so he started to run faster and you know now we've got uh it's the technology it's to being able to process the data it is the the mirrors it's the 90 uh percent quantum efficiency and now we have the salience, the horses, they're running side by side and we're making each other run faster. And we can take now a hundred photos, a thousand photos, a hundred hours and put them into an instant. You know, all that work into one picture, into one instant. And you know, that's, that's why we're discovering exoplanets um, because the horse races, they're getting so good. The horses are so fast. And you know, you take a picture now and it's a photo finish and you don't know who's gonna win. Because, you know, tomorrow, uh, ZWO is going to have a new camera. And then the day after that, we're going to have a new telescope. And then the day after that, we're going to have a great new mount. And processing speeds are increasing. So now's the time. You know, we don't know when, uh, when something's yeah. going to happen, when the skies are going to get filled with satellites. And, and we won't have this special opportunity we do have now um, that no one before us has had, that the great astronomers would couldn't even dream about the photos that these two, this 14 year old and this 22 year old guy were just able to get and show you all. I mean, if, if Struve or Fraunhofer or even Bodie were able to see these photos that these kids just showed us, I mean, they would be blown away. Yeah, they'd fall out. They'd fall if, out of if, their chair. If someone just, uh, just a recommendation. I know I've mentioned this before, but I just want to harp on it. When I was getting serious into astrophotography, I thought I had to have the best camera or the best telescope, but it's really, if you're going to make a big purchase, I mean, Cameron can tell you, I mean, go with the mount because the mount is what's going to make your picture. It's definitely the, it's the workhorse of it your makes setup. It so much more enjoyable. Yeah. And it's also, Easier. yeah, it's what's going to make the picture. I mean, try taking a long exposure without a, without an equatorial mount. So so oh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it, it's a really a, it's a system level um it's a three-legged stool right you have uh the mount slash mechanics you have the optical right the telescope and the eyepiece yeah. or, or the image train mm -hmm. and then finally the technology right the imaging itself uh all those three have come together the optics has been the most mature for the longest time we've got that perfected i mean we we have excellent optics they're refurbishing old observatories and they're beautiful but now they're putting you know, and they, and then they also had the, the excellent mounts. The mounts were discovered, like you say, EQ mounts were discovered many years ago and perfected. But now we're, we've adapted electronics and, um, and computer technology and, of course, imaging. And now you're putting on these observatories, adaptive or, you know, adaptive optics, um, you know, a lot of image processing. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention that. Um, Thank you, Cameron. You have, you have uh, all the new uh, motor drive systems that are much more intelligent for error correction and that. 
you, you, you combine that and now we have a beautiful, perfect combination where we, we really rebalance the system and get the maximum out of all those three components. And, and, and that's the beauty. So if you have an old equatorial mount, like if I kept that mount that I had 20 years ago, it would still be good today. You know, it's, uh, the mechanics were fine. The super polarized uh, mount was a great mount. And I think, uh, yeah, that, yeah, you know, I mean, because of it, you have so much more younger people looking, getting into astronomy because they're looking, they look at astrophotography as art combined with they technology or they science, can do science. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, look for Dylan example, he's yeah. 14 years old, taking Hubble quality pictures. Yeah. So. You can do it. And Muhammad, who just finished college, uh, I mean, great work. So next week, Chuck, we're going to tell everybody, we're going to show you how to put this on a tripod. We're going to show you how to polar line this big bad boy. And uh, I don't know. I want we one might of those. try to show you Conair. Uh, that is... Um, Me too. <laughs> it, that's pretty difficult, but uh, maybe maybe Chuck will tackle that one. Yeah. And then before we go, I just, I told you guys last week, um, Chuck and I would be certifying some scopes. And we just personally collimated this one ourselves. We checked uh, to make sure everything was perfect. It's an achromatic. It's essentially pretty close to what, uh, what Struve was using. And uh, you're going to get to see some beautiful stuff with it. So is this a 102? It's a 102. 102 AR-102 doublet. AR-102 doublet. Yeah. Chuck and I put it together for you. We put a brand new awesome focuser we, re we rebuilt. Uh, we collimated it ourselves and we even had, um, Alex who is great. Look at it, check it, make sure we did everything right. So, um, it's beautiful. Send us an email. This bad boy can be yours. Uh, Scott, do you, uh, you have anything else that you want to share? Uh, for me, no, I, we have, uh, you know, our next global star party next Tuesday. Um, of course, Monday we will have, uh, how do you know with uh, Daniel Barth? Um, we've got you know a whole week of shows uh, uh, to talk about, including the next you know focus on astrophotography program number six. So, what do you yeah. guys? What will uh, do you have any early uh, information about that? Well, uh, working on the. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, hopefully, we can shoot a little. I can shoot a little bit next week and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm a uh, putting you on the spot. My <laughs> I, can I suggest a topic? <laughs> what are we can I next week? Um, can, I, can I suggest we'll a topic? We'll have some good stories. We'll definitely have some good yeah. stories, and uh, I, I'm not sure if our guests will be able to match. Okay, all right. Match Dylan <laughs> okay. or Muhammad, but you uh, know, how did you find? Uh, how did you find these two young guys here? Uh, so Dylan said, so "There's a little astrophotography." Well, it's not little, but uh, Dylan. Mm -hmm. I just started my astrophotography Instagram at beginning of summer, but Dylan, there's a, it seems like Dylan's a part of this astrophotography community on Instagram and he's always posting these great pictures. Oh, okay. so I just gave great. a shout out to him and he decided great. to come on with us. Yeah. Well, and uh, Mohammed is, is where I find everybody and that's Astro Ben. Um, Astro Ben. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's very, awesome. Astro Ben is yeah. so international. It's really cool. You know, yeah. so I, you know, when you bring in people like that, you know, from around the world, uh, I have, I get these, what I call internet moments because, you know, we didn't always have the internet in my generation. So <laughs> there have been uh, times where, you know, I did, um, you know, um, uh, one of them was taking a internet dish back in the nineties. Okay. And connecting and, uh, sending email and, and that kind of thing. So we didn't, we didn't do this kind of live broadcasting back at that time, but uh, uh, the internet's really been just such an amazing, incredible tool for astronomers. I mean, we're, we're in touch uh, uh, around the world uh, at a moment's notice, uh, you know, to share stuff uh, with also a global audience. So it's just, it's totally cool. And, and Mohammed, I, I wanted to ask you too, uh, you know, I'd asked, um, uh, you know, Daniel, how he got started. Uh, but, but what's your story? How did you get started in astronomy? Uh, okay. <laughs> so it really started in 2018. Um, I, I opened Facebook. I found a, an event called uh, a place called Kotomei Observatory. We go there and experience uh, how does an observa observatory work and like this. 
Okay. Uh, I opened I opened uh, Google and find out the the place there is really really dark. Um, in 2018, I just got my my smartphone. Um, I just knew that there is something called smartphone astrophotography hmm. uh, using the Pro mode. Um, so I, sh- I like the first very very first time I got a small tripod and I shot the sky. Uh, apparently. Uh, I shot a comet called uh, 46P, I can't spell it, I guess, by Artin or something like that. Okay. Uh, it came in the picture randomly, and there everything popped, like literally. Uh, wow. two, days ago, two days after, uh, I opened the Amazon and I ordered my first uh, binocular. So I, start, I started doing astrophotography using like my smartphone, my smartphone mounted on the binocular. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I got like the Orion Nebula... It's, it was extremely faint and then I got a few moon, moon photos I was really happy with them like I, I shot the moon uh, our yeah. neighbor yeah um, right then I went to yeah, my thank car. you to all of those who <laughs> developed a smartphone yeah yeah, 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 yeah right, right? <laughs> yeah there was uh Scott I mean I, I know we're kind of running over but uh, uh Joe Rogan he was on Instagram the other day I think he got one of those new galaxy phones and he was just taking pictures yeah it. and it was like crazy like he took a picture of the moon and it looked like he took it through a telescope like it's really? crazy what wow. these phones are starting to do yeah it what, is what, amazing what, it's good it's given a lot of so that's that's muhammad's uh, uh, yeah. path that's his yeah. path he, he gets I actually of, uh, so social media yeah. uh a smartphone and uh well you live in an area that's got uh, I know when you get outside of Cairo, it's extremely dark, yeah, yeah. and uh, the 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 astrophotos that you have are uh, your technique's amazing. But uh, also, I mean, that one shot where that guy is sitting there with the fire and the cigarette and all the rest of it that just that's just so cool. That should be a National mm-hmm. Geographic magazine. Okay, it's totally cool. <laughs> so, very so good, much. very beautiful, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, let let me show you something if possible. Yeah. Um, last week, uh, I went to a place, uh, I got my old smartphone and I made it shoot the Milky Way for like four hours straight. And then I made the time lapse. The, the result is like extremely mesmerizing. You can't believe like how detailed the Milky Way is. Uh, can I show you the yeah, uh, yeah. possible? Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Did you try sending that picture into a pod with the guy? Um, no. <laughs> I send, yeah, send you that should. into Apod. I'm should. telling you because they like unique photos, and I think you would. Uh, I think you'd be surprised. That was cell phone. <laughs> that is crazy. That's cell phone. Hey. Cell phone. Oh, nice. Wow. Hey. Look at that. You see, I try to take stuff with my cell phone, but my hands shake too bad. <laughs> I drink too yeah. much caffeine. <laughs> I'll have to show you a cell phone holder. That's very cool. Beautiful work, Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you all again for coming on. Thank you. I think I really think this is our best show yet. And uh, I mean, because of y'all. Yeah, exactly. Yes. The last show is always the best show. (laughs) They get better and better from here, guys. So, well, that's fantastic. You guys, you know, all of you that have followed us on the in the audience. I didn't really. uh, uh, normally I kind of uh, recognize them and I'll just quickly recognize you now. We have Richard Grace, Cameron Gillis, who's on our show, Andrew Corkill. He and I were talking earlier today about the programs and uh, he loves uh, focus on astrophotography. He loves, you know, he loves the way that uh, uh, you guys are, you know, constantly entertaining. So it's, it's great. Mike Wiesner's on, on, he says, happy Friday, everybody. Harold Locke, um, uh, I apparently somehow on yesterday's broadcast uh, with um, uh, with uh, Caitlin Ahrens and Abel Mendez, I forgot somehow that I didn't turn off the live stream. So it went on for like almost 12 hours or something. So it was kind of crazy. Sorry about that. Uh, I, I What I can do is download it, edit it, put it back up. <laughs> so anyhow. Um, Bergman Scooter's on with us, um, uh, Book Davies, um, I think we had, uh, Kinslayer, Kinslayer01, um, is watching, not sure where that, where Kinslayer's from, 
Uh, Norm Hughes might have mentioned him. Um, we've got uh, Ahmed Mohammed Ragab. Okay, so I th so I think you've got a great great audience following you. Alam uh, Musa uh, Amal Mukhtar and um, let's see, Usama Ismail. Uh, Muhammad is bringing the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. My father. We got, we got fans. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, it's, I think his friends and, and his family were watching for sure. That's just totally cool. Uh, Muhammad Maktar was which was watching as well. Uh, that's cool. Um, and uh, who else? I think that's kind of it right there as far as I can see. But uh, it was great to see all you guys on. Sorry if I missed you from the chat. Um, but um, uh, you guys have a great weekend. Uh, and we will see you on Monday. Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you so Bye. much. Good, Good job, Bye. Mom and Dylan. You all did great. Good to meet you, Mom. Awesome job. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for having me. me. Scott. Thank you.